welcome to uh, the fourth webinar in our series. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit more about documentary work. Um, and I'm going to talk about my book, which I've got here, and the shooting of that. I'll come back to that in a sec. Um, just going to mention what's coming up in the future, whilst I've got your attention at the beginning here. Um, we will be doing uh, a webinar next week, same time, same place, with a panel discussion between, uh, well, amongst myself, uh, Bill Green, and uh, Mark Strawn, so three experienced photographers. It's pretty much uh, an open session. Uh, we don't have a particular agenda, so we're basically there to take your questions on all things photographic, and between us, we should be able to hash out a good answer for you. So that's next Friday. Friday after that, um, not sure, we'll come, we'll be in touch. We've got somebody lined up, but haven't quite confirmed it yet. So rather than say right now, I'll, uh, I'll leave that until the next newsletter. And the week after that, we should have Jesse Marlow. Uh, that'll be the 22nd. So these things are all confirmed in our newsletter on each, each Friday, we, we're setting that out. So uh, something to look forward to for the future. Okay, let me just see. We've got 135 people already signed in, which is really good. Um, feel free to ask questions as well. Um, in previous webinars, I've said, can you wait till the end to ask questions? But this isn't a particularly long talk about what I'll be discussing with my book. Um, so it would be nice if uh, some of those uh, images that I show you uh, provoke some questions. And I'm happy I can see them on my screen right here. So I'll try and do my best to answer them. And if I get a flood, I'll just answer the ones that I find the easiest, <laughs> or at least the ones that are the easiest to answer. So let's get on with that. All right, I'm going to swap my screen to my little monitor here. Uh, if I can find the right little control, there it is. Uh, desktop number two, share. So with a bit of luck, you should be able to see the beginning of my slideshow. So um, this is a talk that I did um, in the Leica store in uh, Melbourne where this exhibition is currently hanging on the walls. Um, so when we do an exhibition, as you probably know, if you've been to one, we have the artist, in, that case, in this case, me, uh, do a little presentation about the images and the information about how the picture was shot, the, the thought process and so on. So basically that's what I'm gonna go through. Um, Heart of Australia is the name of the, the book. Um, I'm just gonna come back to me just so I can show you that again. So this is the book that we're talking about here. Um, it's a nice hardcover book. Show you inside of it just to prove that it exists. There we go. This is the sort of thing we've got. Uh, it's in the bookshops. It's in the Leica store. I've got a link at the end to the Leica store, um, which we can, we can use, but there we go. Hopefully that uh, shows up okay. So that's the book there. And then let me come back to the slides. There we go. All right, so that first image that you can see behind my title, this, this epitomizes part of my approach to my documentary photography because um, one of the things I'm really keen on doing is getting right inside the action. Um, th this is taken on stage. Uh, this is Yothu Yindi. Uh, you'll remember them, I'm sure, with their, their uh, big hit they had um, or back in the 90s, I believe it was, Treaty. Might have been the late 80s, not very good with dates. Um, but this is Yothu Yindi playing once more, and this is at the Yarrabah Music Festival. And it, it's not that difficult to get pictures of performers on stage, especially at a small music festival like this. But what I wanted to do was to include the audience as much as possible. Um, and that meant shooting from behind over the performers into the audience. So I'm there with my media high-vis vest on, and pretty much able to go wherever I wanted. And that was a big part of the, uh, the, 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 um, the privilege, if you like, of being there. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about access as we go through the pictures. So um, this is shot on the Leica CL. Um, and I'll go through, in fact, here's the cameras that I used right here. And there's another lens here, which I don't have about, that one, 35 mm Similax. Those are, that's my entire kit for the whole, the whole shoot, uh, SL. Um, so you can't see what I'm talking about, can you? Sorry. <laughs> um, there we go. All right. Back to me. Um, this is my entire kit. Um, the 55 to 135 on the CL, the standard zoom on the CL, CL body, uh, SL, uh, 24 to 90, 18 mil M lens and 35 mil Similux. And the reason I mentioned the 35 mil Similux is because I used it for a lot 
of these sorts of images like this one because low light, obviously a big deal. And that was shot on the CL 35 mm Similax. Um, this lens works beautifully for this sort of work because um, the autofocus is really quick. Uh, it's nice and light. And at f1.4, you get that lovely out of focus background. So um, not a huge amount of, of gear that was used. And as I go through the pictures, I know I'll get a question about which camera was used for which shot. And I'll do my best to explain which one it was. Um, so we've got a question coming up already. Uh, how do you handle shooting with the sun behind your subject and maintaining detail on the subject? Um, that's a tricky one. Basically, use Leica lenses. That's always a good thing. Um, but really, uh, can I come back to that one? And I'll try and answer that one a bit later on. I've got some images that show you why I often shoot into the sun. So let me come back to the one, that one, and we will move on. So next picture. Okay, this is up at... Uh, hmm, can't remember the name of the festival. That's terrible. It's in the book here. It's up near Catherine. Um, and this is where the, a lot of the local indigenous people come to demonstrate their dance moves to do. They have like a, a dance off. They do their, their, their dances and they obviously congregate and meet. And you can go and visit this and you can actually see a lot of the traditional activities in place. And I was very lucky to be able to get permission to go and photograph that. Um, and one of the shots I had in mind for this project was um, getting that um, a, bit, a bit more abstract, a little bit less just depictive and a little bit more no, I won't, I won't use the word arty, but a, a little bit. So it, it's about the details. Um, if, if anybody was listening to my Essence of Landscape talk, um, you'll know that you can actually abst abstract details out of a shot, and that is representative of the whole thing. Um, and, and in this case, it was about the dust and the color and the feet stamping, and uh, that was why I thought this image worked quite well. So to give you a bit of a perspective on why I was at this particular event and why I'd been photographing at Yothu Yindi at Yarrabah, um, winding the clock back a while, um, I did a job for the South Australian government. Um, and that was a, maybe four, five, six years ago, going back a fair ways. And that job came off the back of a photograph I took in the early 90s um, in on the Udnadatta track at William Creek, that's right. And I photographed a policeman with his car, and that was that, it was a nice picture, went in this book I did on South Australia. Wind the clock forward to 2013, 14 maybe, not, that's a decade, 12, 15 years later, long time, forgotten all about it. Get this email, hi, my name is, whatever his name was, I can't remember now. Uh, I was the policeman that you photographed and put in your book about South Australia. My first reaction on reading this was, oh, 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 what have I done wrong? And he said, I now have a new role. I'm not a policeman anymore. I work for the Outback Communities Association of South Australia. And he's the guy who runs. It's, it's a little bit like um, uh, a, count, a council that, uh, that represents the north of South Australia, all of the outback communities. And he wanted to commission a photographer to go and photograph community activities in the outback of South Australia. Well, that's got me written all over it. So as soon as, uh, as, soon as we could, we turned that into a big road trip. And we, uh, we drove, my wife and myself, we drove out to uh, a fair number of the more obscure parts of the, uh, the northern half of South Australia, photographed a lot of communities. That came off uh, well, we got some nice pictures, the client was happy, drew a line under that and moved on. Until it came to discussing new projects for new books. Now, this is in fact my 15th book. Whoops, I've just gone back, there we go. My 15th book. And we're always looking for new ideas. So I'm pretty sure it was my wife, Janelle, who suggested, you know, all those pictures that we shot of communities. Well, we really enjoyed that, didn't we? And we got some really nice material. So why don't we expand the scope of that and do a book on communities? And then we came up with the idea of calling it Heart of Australia because we wanted it to be the outback and the country, not so much the cities. There's country people, um, outback people, and the more obscure festivals. Now, that then morphed into not so obscure festivals like Tamworth and the Dinelican Dinele Ute Muster, but they were, they're still all country connected. So like the Echo in Brisbane is a city festival, but it's country people who come to that festival. So we ended up going to about 
25 different festivals. Um, in fact, if I look in the, I'm just looking at the index in my book here and 25. Um, and so we did these as a series of uh, either road trips or flights and high cars and so on. And it took me almost 18 months to photograph from start to finish. So it was a, a fairly large project. Um, the picture that's on the screen now um, also uh, is from um, the, uh, the Aboriginal festival up near uh, Catherine. And again, it comes down to that, uh, that abstract view. Um, there's obviously lots of pictures in the book of the wider view, but we've also got these tight in shots of just showing the hands and the painting, trying to capture a sense of that sort of traditional activity. So uh, there's a, a lot of variety there. And as we went to these festivals, we noticed one very important thing. We were astonishingly welcome. Now, I had, of course, uh, arranged permission to be in these places. We, we write to places. We, um, we, phone call, we make phone calls. We find out who's organizing it. And there's usually a PR person or a marketing person who is responsible for getting publicity for the event. So people come, which is, you know, it's a, it's a nice mechanism. And you can slot quite easily into that as a photographer. We have a letter from the publisher saying what we were doing and without exception, every single festival that we approached said, absolutely welcome to come. Uh, here's either a press pass or just turn up and have a word at the door with, with Joe or somebody, of, this is for the smaller festivals. So every single one we went to, we were expected. And this really opens up a lot of opportunities. Now, I was able to get that permission because I was working on a project. Now that doesn't mean to say it has to be a paying project, but some cohesive project means that you can go to a PR person to festival and say, Hey, I'm working on this project. Can I get permission to come and photograph uh, the, the, the events? And amazing how frequently people will be quite happy and they'll be very keen to have you share your pictures with them. So it becomes, quite a quid pro quo situation. That's what we found. We, we did send pictures back to the people we photographed. And uh, we also, um, people that we had photographed specifically, as in portraits, we got their emails, addresses, and we would send them a copy of the picture that we took. So we were able to put something back into the whole process. Next picture. This um, is Mulawa. I can remember where this one was. Um, this is up near um, inland from Geraldton, so about four or five hours north of Perth. And I was actually here with my last guest, Christian Fletcher, who we did our uh, interview with last week. Um, this, is, uh, this takes me back to the first question by Rolf Domino, and I was waiting for this shot so I could answer his question. Shooting into the sun like this gives me... Um, certain uh, characteristics. Uh, the obvious one is the dust, because if you can shoot into the sun and you've got dust being picked up, you will get that dust backlit and it stands out so much stronger. So you end up with a series of sort of flat cutouts almost or silhouettes against the shapes of the dust. And I find this a really compelling way to work. Um, as far as how do you do it? Um, the um, just let me just get my thoughts straight here. There's no real secret to it. Um, I think that you, you're really just letting the camera do the work. And this is where a good camera comes into play. This, this was shot on the CL using the uh, 55 to 135 zoom. And you'll find that the telephoto zooms do tend to compress the perspective a bit and it does tend to exaggerate that dustiness. But as far as techniques are concerned, I'm using the autofocus, I'm getting the, the exposure meter do its own thing. I'm pretty much relying on the camera to get me a good result. And the success rate was very high. So really the point here is don't be shy about pointing your camera into the sun. Uh, you'll often get a really, really nice result and there's no real big secret to it. I suppose the only thing I would say is you need good glass. Uh, cheap lenses uh, like well, even, and phones and things. They just don't really work shot into the sun very well, but good optical quality lenses make a big difference here. Um, next question, John Milkins, when you are engaged in a project with a catalog of images in your mind's eye that you want to capture, is it easier with digital to know you have it nailed? Alternatively, does checking the image on the LCD distract you? Oh, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, 
The answer to the first one is yes, it is a lot easier with digital because I know I've nailed it. I can move on in my mind. I've got my little catalog of images, as you suggest, and I can go, I can look at the shot and I can go, yeah, nailed that one and move on. Or if I think I can do better, go and continue and keep shooting. Um, does checking on the image on the LCD distract you? Absolutely. And I tend not to do that in the moment. I tend not to check my screen immediately. And I do see a lot of people doing that. And I've all, I will always say to them, don't chimp your pictures immediately because you might miss something. That's for something, that's something you do in a lull. Okay, you should be confident enough not to need to do that unless it's something that you have uh, a lot of creative control over. Like you're working with a setup, you might want to change things very slightly, in which case, fine, you can check each picture. But when you're shooting in a documentary style, I would suggest that you actually try to get out of the habit of looking at those pictures. Melvin Tan would like to know, how do you balance your approach to such events where I imagine your journalistic mind will try to capture scenes to tell the story, yet at the same time, there's always the desire to seek out more fine art and abstract images. I frequently struggle with the fear of missing out. I'm aware that a unique style is also about that unique edited mix of images. That's another perceptive question. Um, if I'm working for a magazine, I will probably have a fairly tight uh, brief on what to shoot and I'll be working within a, a often a journalist story that they've already written or they are researching as we shoot like I work for Australian Geographic so uh, we'll have a story in mind and we'll be researching that as we go and we will be working towards that as far as images are concerned when I'm doing a book and essentially my book they're my pictures and I am the one who gets to say what goes in and what goes out to a certain degree so it does allow me a lot more artistic freedom you, you have to have certain images. You have to have the positional shot or the establishing shot, the wide shot of the, the event, and most of the events you'll see in the book uh, have some sort of establishing shot. Then you have to have pictures of what's going on, the different events, but always I was looking for, and this is a crucial point, I was not looking for coverage or documenting everything. I was looking for individual hero shots. And if I missed an event or I missed something, I wasn't going to stress about it. So there's lots of things at these events I didn't photograph, but I was always looking for images which you could hang on your wall. So that's not something you would do if you were doing newspaper work or documentary work for a magazine. You would probably have to document all the events, get the prize winner, get the name of the prize winner, um, all of those sorts of things. I wasn't going to do that. I was only interested in things that I thought were visually interesting. And that's a luxury you don't often get in documentary work. Um, I've just got a couple more questions here. Let's move on. Another shot to talk about that. Let's get this going. Oops, there we go. So this is um, same same rodeo. Oh no, yeah, the same rodeo, same rodeo, Malawa. Um, when I said answer that last question, I'm always looking for opportunities, not necessarily for coverage. Um, this is Jared Hen Hendersby. Um, he is a what they call a clown. I, I know it sounds a bit disparaging, but in, the, in rodeo terms, it's the guy who distracts the ball when the rodeo rider has fallen off, and it's a safety device. And he's a rider as well as a clown, and his job is to get in the way of the ball uh, after the the cowboy has fallen off, and can, so he can get to safety. He Talk about Mr. Tough Guy. His knuckles were all split. He was all taped up. He's got, he's a ropey guy, but obviously hard as nails. And I did miss a picture of him getting completely skittled by a bull once, which was a shame. Uh, just as he got completely flattened, somebody walked right in front of me. And it's one of those pictures that's in my mind, but not on my memory card. So uh, not to worry. But um, this sort of shot, uh, again, into the, into the light, as you can see, uh, just epitomizes the action and the drama. And it, it, it's not so much where it is, um, it happens to be at Mulawa, but it, it seems to me to just epitomize the, the standoff between the bull, which is really mad, and the cowboy trying to keep him down uh, or trying to get off the pitch, and then Jared there keeping him at bay. And he's very, very nimble, this guy, quite astonishing. This is the Man from Snowy River Festival, which is in Victoria, held in Victoria. And I think 72 highly skilled riders compete over three days in various events. This is obviously a roping event. The level of horsemanship you will see at these events is astonishing. I mean, you can go to these events and take part. You've just got to pay the entry fee um, and you can take photographs as much as you like. 
I had permission again, and that did allow me to have a quiet word sometimes with the security guards to say, look, can I just go and stand over there? And it's a safe spot, but it's not quite where the ropes are, you know, are restricting us to. And most of the time they'll go, yeah, that's no worries. Thanks for asking. Just gives you that little bit of extra access. And in this particular case, I was kneeling down right at the front of the audience in the dirt between a, a safety barrier and the railings around the outside of the arena so I could poke my camera through the steel bars. They would not let me go inside the arena, which is, which is fair enough. Um, you know, I'm not crazy. Um, going back to some uh, questions, and here's a very pertinent one from this picture. <laughs> In fact, it's a very apt one. Um, how do you protect your equipment from the dust? Well, do the best you can. Now, the CL uh, is not so weather protected as the SL. Um, this particular shot on the screen at the moment was taken on the SL with the 24 to 90 because, um, actually, no, that's not true. I tell a lie. This was taken on the 55 to 135. I was using the SL in preference because that dust in that shot kept wafting over me, and I was really not that keen on getting the CL covered in dust because the weather ceiling is just not as good. However, there were certain shots that I had to shoot with it because I had the telephoto lens on that camera. So in this case, what I was doing was as soon as the dust was wafting towards me, I was basically turning my back and crouching over the camera to try and keep the worst of the dust off it. And as it turned out, it was fine. You should have seen the cameras at the end of it. They were caked in dust. The SL, of course, was fine, as was the CL. But I was a little bit worried at one point because, uh, you know, with a zoom, when you zoom in and out, you... The, the, the lens extends and it can suck dust in. Well, it didn't. So it's obviously a well-manufactured camera. Um, question from Carl Schuster. Did you crop the shot? I think I've moved past the picture we're talking about. So if, if Carl did like to ask that one again, uh, I'll come back to that one. Uh, do I use my histogram for taking your images? Absolutely, I do. I prefer to use the histogram and I'm constantly looking at it to see my exposures. I'm not that interested in whether my exposure compensation is either a bit plus or a bit minus. What I want is a good histogram. And I don't obsess over it. I will always prioritize the shot first, uh, getting the shot, getting it sharp over a perfect exposure. But I'm always looking at the histogram just to keep an eye on things. And also, more importantly, have the highlight warning, the highlight flashing warning, whatever they call it, set. So that if there's a highlight, it will flash in my viewfinder. And that gives me a clue as to something might be a bit overexposed. And if it's a specular highlight, don't worry about it. If it's an important highlight, like on someone's face, then I will dial back a little bit of exposure comp to, 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 uh, to remove that highlight. Um, I do that a lot. And in fact, that's pretty much my standard technique for exposure. Um, next question. Um, where do you focus on? Oh, where do you focus on on an action shot like this in the rodeo? You do the best you can. You know, there's obviously things are three dimensional. Um, I would I would generally say that the nearest object would be the one you photo you, you focus on if there's a choice. Like if you had a the horse and the rider looking towards you, do you photograph on the horse's head or the rider? Look, it's a really tricky one. Um, the one in the, on the screen right now, if you look at this image and a big print, you'll see that this horse is perfectly sharp right the way through, but the rider is not. Now, there's no way you could have them both sharp. And if I'd focused on him, I don't think it would have made any difference to the picture. I, I like the texture in this horse's uh, fur, or, um, hair, um, coat. But if it had been sharp on the rider, it would have been like 50-50 proposition. As it was, it's the nearer object, and my inclination is to photograph the nearer thing. Back-focused images tend not to be quite as effective, um, very much case-dependent, so a bit hard to give you a definitive answer on that one. Good question, though. Uh, Robin Page, audio, auto or manual focus? Um, auto focus for this sort of stuff, um, but not exactly the way you might imagine. I'm not using the focus tracking. Um, I find that whilst it works really well, you do have to keep the point of focus on the thing you want to focus on and let it track that. But if something moves quickly, the focus may decide to try and focus on something else. So if you, if you miss or something moves across the front of you or the, the subject moves slightly out of frame, you may find that the continuous auto focus will try and pick up something else. It's, what I tend to do is single shot focus and I 
I press the shutter button repeatedly to focus, 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 focus as something comes towards me. So it's like a series of steps. And that means as long as my finger's lifted, it's not going to try and catch another subject and I don't lose my focus. And I've found that that works really well with the SL and the CL. Um, it's a technique I've developed over the years, it takes a bit of practice, but really as something comes towards you, you just focus, 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 focus shoot, focus, 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 shoot. And on the SL, I use the rear button for that. On the CL, I can't, so I have to use the shutter button, but in both cases, it worked pretty well. All right, let's move on to another picture. <laughs> I had to put this one in because um, I, I, this is one of my favorite pictures. So the Danilican Ute Muster has a well-deserved reputation as being a little bit crazy. Let's just say that. Um, there's a lot of young people having a wonderful time uh, around there. Let me see. It was around the 9,000 Ute mark. It wasn't quite a record that year, but it was over 9,000 Utes turned up. It's a whole weekend. Uh, you're only allowed one case of beer per person per day or spirit. So very, very low limit on the alcohol. Um, I don't know how they manage. And so there's a lot of, um, what should we say, uh, horse play. Let, let's call it that. Now, we were wandering around with our media vests on. I've got cameras hanging around my neck. We were obviously taking photographs. So what happened was we'd have people running out and saying, hey, mate, come and check out this. It's, you, you know, you're going to have a good laugh at this. And we found that we just let ourselves be led by people. These guys in this shot were having a great old time. And they're just hamming it up for the camera. And they would be hamming it up for anybody who came past. So it's a legitimate shot in my mind. And when the guy um, turns around and drops his trousers, I thought, this may not be a shot I can use. Well, luckily, he still had his striped underpants on, and it's just about okay. But it's just the expressions. You, this guy is just absolutely howling with laughter. They're all, there's all good expressions. They're all having a great time. So it's a nice, well-balanced shot. I think that was shot on the 24 to 90 on the SL. Um, in a situation like this, a mid-range zoom is going to be your go-to lens because you're never quite sure what's going to happen. And you really need to be able to nail that shot quickly because you're not going to set this shot up. You've got, to, you've got to shoot it as it happens, when it happens, right now, and capture that movement. You can't be mucking around with the controls. You can't be mucking around changing lenses. None of those things. It's got to be spontaneous. And in previous talks, I've mentioned this idea of mastering your camera before you go out shooting. Learn how to focus sharply on something, learn how to change the settings without thinking, get that out of the way before you actually get into a situation where you need to be thinking quickly and operating quickly because you will lose pictures if you do that. Okay, questions. Do I shoot film these days? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, part of me thinks maybe one day I might get an old large format camera and shoot some single shot um, black and white images and tray process them and do some interesting printing. But to be honest, I haven't got round to it. So it's been digital since 2005. So that's what, 15, 16 years of solid digital. All righty. Oops, flicking pictures here. Another crazy event, and I mean crazy, was the Henley on Todd Regatta in Alice Springs. It's the only event that's ever been cancelled for having water, as opposed to having not having any water. So this is the, um, the dried up riverbed of the Todd River, which runs through uh, Alice Springs. And it obviously refers to the Henley Regatta in London, which is a little bit different, to put it mildly. They still follow the same theme. They have, uh, they have uh, what do they call them, kayaks, and they have sailboats, and they have all sorts of things, all of which have no bottoms, and you have to carry them. So that's legs sticking out of the bottom of the kayaks and the sailing boats. Um, it's an absolute hoot. It's all done with a, an amazing uh, sense of uh, humor, and there's an enormous amount of cheating goes on, which is great fun. There's pirates, there's, um, there's Vikings knocking around, but the, the, the crescendo, which is probably the right word in this case, is the battle boats at the end of the day. And there's three of them. There's only two in this shot, but there's also a Viking ship somewhere, probably charging up on the right. So on the left is the Navy. On the right is the pirates. And when I say the Navy, I mean the Navy, the Australian Navy. These are all sailors in our Navy, professional sailors. They're not just people pretending to be the Navy. So they take part. Uh, on the right-hand side, yeah, they're definitely pirates. 
and they have these mortars which fire out it's, it's, it's like deco like sand it's, it's basically the same stuff the river's made of but they have real gunpowder in these pipes and they fire it off it's i'm amazed they're even allowed to do it these days there's water cannons on the back high pressure water cannons uh, they lob flower bombs at each other and water bombs and they drive around this arena underneath those uh, holes i think is some sort of tractor not sort of four wheel drive, it would get bogged too easily, but it's a probably a tractor with big tires. It's, they, they have their secrets. And then they just drive around and try and just get each other as wet and as dirty as possible. It's an absolute blast. Uh, I was allowed in the arena for this one, but only in one spot. And the, uh, the organizer who, was, um, who gave me my press pass was very eagle eyed with the two or three photographers who was there because obviously if somebody got hurt, she'd be the, be the one responsible. Uh, questions. Um, Overall, what's your favorite camera, the most versatile and easy to use? Well, that's an easy one to answer, like a SL or SL2. Um, by far the most versatile and easiest to use camera I've ever, ever, ever actually owned. Um, it's a, I call it my get the job done camera. Uh, it's a no fuss camera, it's robust, it's not the smallest camera in the world, but you know that's an, e that's an easy price to pay when you realize just how incredibly versatile it is and how amazingly useful um, or how easy it is to actually operate. Ken Wang would like to know, do I shoot wide open? Absolutely, I do. Um, that shot on the left there is shot on the SL with the 75mm Summicron at f2, wide open. Um, if you ever hear our senior lens designer at Leica, Peter Carver, talking about the lenses, he always says, why do you not shoot wide open? These lenses are designed to be used wide open. And, and he's right. Uh, Leica lenses are designed to be shot wide open. Now, that's not the case with all lenses. Um, some are better at f8 or f5.6, but Leica lenses are designed to be used wide open and where possible, I will use them in that way because I just love the three dimensionality you get when you've got limited depth of field. Obviously there's situations where it's not appropriate and I will use the aperture accordingly, but I have zero fear of shooting wide open. The quality is just as good as, as, as at any other f-stop. On the right hand side, this is, um, this is the Huon Valley Midwinter Festival, um, in fact, and another very strange place. Think a mixture of sort of pagan wicker and also Game of Thrones, and that will give you an idea of what's going on there. On the right is Big Willy being burned. He's, he's actually lit by archers firing flaming arrows. Of course he is. And it, that, that figure is about 50 feet high. And when it goes off, it looks quite spectacular. That's also shot on the 75 mil Summicron, also shot wide open with a very high shutter speed. And that's why the flames look so frozen. And that this is, um, all of these are visible as prints on the wall of the Leica Gallery in Melbourne. Um, some of them are quite big prints too, and that will give you a much better idea of just how incredibly high quality these cameras and lenses are if you go and see them in person. Question. Uh, oh, tricky one. What makes a good picture good? Yeah. Don't know if I can answer that one in probably less than an hour. Maybe need a good glass of red wine. Um, very tricky. I'll leave that one alone. Sorry, I'm piking on that one. Um, Timothy Moon would like to know, and this is a good question. Again, they're all good questions, these. How much post-processing do you use for your documentary shots? Well, as little as possible. Um, so here's a couple of good examples. And in fact, this comes back to the do you shoot wide open question as well, because both of those are shot on the 75mm Summicron on the SL uh, at F2, wide open. And you can see that lovely fall off of focus, which gives it that three-dimensionality. Both of these pictures are, well, they would both have less than 30 seconds work done on them in Lightroom in post. Um, all I'm doing in my post processing is sweetening the image for reproduction. This is not Photoshopping or anything like that. This is purely preparing the raw file, which is necessarily a little bit flat, um, giving it a bit of contrast, a little bit of extra punch and preparing it for the printed page uh, and also for slideshows such as this. Very few of my pictures have more than, uh, like I said, 30 seconds work. A minute would be a long time. Very occasionally, when I've got a more complicated image, like an auto bracketed shot, it might take me three or four minutes to do it, but certainly no more than that. Oh, incidentally, these are both from the Huon Valley Midwinter Festival again. Uh, you might have guessed that one. Oh, sorry. No, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. The right hand side is the Huon Valley Midwinter Festival. The left hand side is Miss Bacon Fest 2018. Um, that's a real event. 
documented in my book here. Uh, and they have a beauty pageant where a bunch of young ladies um, do strut their stuff on the stage, but they're dressed in that 50s glamour style. Uh, absolutely fantastic. And she even had a bath towel, which was in the shape of a rasher of bacon. So a lot of good puns were had at, at that festival. It was, a, it was a really great one to actually photograph. Um, next shot. How are we doing for time here? Oh, yeah, we're doing well. Okay, now you can't possibly photograph festivals around Australia without going to the Elvis Festival in parks. It may not look it, but this is a 40 degree day. And uh, even when you're, wearing your, when you're wearing a black wig and a, a safari suit with sequins all over it, you get hot. It was astonishing. But the level of, of just lightheartedness and fun that we had on those two days was, was amazing. And, and when people ask me which was my, fe my favorite festival, I usually come back to this one as it was just wholesome and enjoyable and everybody was in the spirit of things and there were wall-to-wall -wall Elvises. It was just great. It was a really great place to photograph because everybody was happy to have their picture taken and in fact, in many cases, welcomed it. There was a question earlier on about shooting into the light. This is a very good example of when I was shooting to the light because I shot this on my 18 mil Elmar on my SL, which is a super wide lens. And if you look at the shadows, you'll see you can set up some very strong diagonals. This shadow particularly here, leading in from the corner. This is an effect that you get with shooting into the sun because obviously the shadow is in front of the subject, not behind. And because it's a wide angle lens, a super wide angle lens, this angle is very strongly exaggerated and it draws your eye in very, very strongly into the, into the subject. Also, whoops, my bad, flags also look great backlit because they are, they're like a, a, a light box, the light shining through them and it makes the colors look that much stronger. So I shoot a lot of stuff into the light. Um, it's my sort of standard go-to technique. Uh, really, really works well. Don't be afraid of shooting into the light ever. Question, Benjamin de Guzman. What is your go-to setup, uh, aperture priority, manual, etc., during day and also nighttime? Um, I shoot almost everything on aperture priority. Um, it seems to me to be the best combination of automation and manual override because I use exposure compensation to modify my exposure. This is whether it's day or night. Occasionally, I'll shoot in manual uh, for specific reasons, maybe for very, very long exposures uh, when the light's too low for the meter to genuinely work properly. I'll use manual, but 95% of the time, I'd be shooting on aperture priority automatic, and then I would use the exposure compensation to modify the actual exposure based on the histogram or the flashing highlights. It's not that hard. Um, you just need to get used to it. Uh, I tend not to obsess too much about the exposures. Uh, I, want, I know that the camera's meter gets me pretty close, and then it's usually just a case of check the, the shutter speed. Is it the right shutter speed for what I want? Yes or no. If it's not, change something like the ISO or the aperture. If there's no flashing highlights and my histogram looks good, shoot the picture. But I'll be shooting the picture before I check the flashing highlights because uh, I want to get that shot just in case something changes. All right, moving along, uh, another Elvis picture. Um, this is Big Bad Elvis in an alleyway. And I've shot this on the 18 mil as well, because I really wanted to exaggerate his stilts, because those are obviously fake feet on the end of his legs. I hope you pick that up. Um, he's posing for me, but he was, he was a street performer during the, 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 uh, the, the festival, and it's his job to just ham it up for the cameras and for the, the visitors and so on. So when someone like me wanders along and says, you know, can you just sit on your Wurlitzer and just do a quick starfish? He goes, yeah, no worries, not a problem. We get his name, we get his email, we send him a copy of the pictures because as a street performer, it's useful for him for, for social media. Uh, so we might as well, you know, put something back. He helps me, I help him, it's all good. This is actually one of my favorite pictures from the book. I, I don't know why, but I just, I just like the dynamics in it. Um, next one. Okay, this is Woodford. This is, uh, this actually, it, it, it's interesting. This turned out to be one of the more difficult festivals to photograph, not so much from a technical point of view or the fact that there was nothing to photograph because there's loads. It was more internally in my head. I, I found this to be quite overwhelming. Um, I've been photographing for a long time, three decades, more than three decades. And I photographed lots of interesting things, lots of slightly scary things, some 
action stuff, some challenging things, some slightly dangerous things. But every now and again, you get a bit of a, a mind freeze when you're presented with almost limitless opportunities. And the other thing about all of these pictures, without exception, uh, or very few exceptions, is that all of people. And I think you'll agree with me when I say that people are probably the hardest subjects to photograph well, because you have to actually engage with people. It's very easy, very tempting to photograph from a distance and pick out photographs with a telephoto lens. But if you want to get really good images, uh, you need to be in close. Robert Kappa once said, if your pictures are not good enough, you're not close enough. And this is a very uh, true statement. Um, so when you're photographing in these places, you've got to be engaging with people. And every now and again, it suddenly just becomes hard and you just don't want to. And you have to like stop, sit, take a break and then get back into it. It's not a natural thing for a lot of people to, uh, I don't know many people who can just wade in, walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know, can I take your picture? Sometimes you've got to warm up to it. So we arrived there and there was so much to do and I was getting nothing. I just couldn't see anything. I couldn't capture anything. I'm looking at the pictures and I'm going, oh, this is just terrible. You know, what am I doing? So the simple answer was to stop. Now, if anyone plays golf, and you know when you're playing golf and it ain't working for you and then you just go that's it i've had enough and you stop and then you find that you're playing well because you've relaxed same thing in photography i stopped sat under a tree had a beer chilled out hour or so and then i thought you know what i better get back into this and then it was all good it was flowing and i was in, into it and i did get to go back on a second day so i did have a, a sort of plan b uh, in, in place. But after that, it was fine. But it was a really bizarre feeling of this sort of mental blockage. And so if you ever have a situation where you just can't do it, you can't get into it, you can't um, uh, just, you're just not feeling creative. And as one of my colleagues, Les Walkling, once said, um, oh, I'm, I, I, I can see nothing today. I've got nothing. Um, I'm, I'm vi I, I've got nothing visual. I can see nothing. And I know what he meant. Um, is sometimes you just can't see um, it doesn't, nothing makes visual sense. That's what he said. Today, nothing makes visual sense. And sometimes you get that. So don't worry about it. Just move on. It's just, uh, and, and shoot. And once you start shooting, you'll find the flow comes back. Next question. Okay. Wing, you would like to know, do I use flash for my pictures? I'd, I'd say out of the pictures in this book, precisely none of them have flash. Um, I find that flash is too slow. Okay, I'll qualify that. When I was working for magazines and newspapers, sometimes you have to use a flash to get a decent exposure because you're, the, the lighting is awful. You've got to photograph it right now and get a usable picture. That's fine. But when you're photographing for higher quality stuff that needs to stand, out for, stand up to more scrutiny, uh, flash on camera used like that just looks low end, let's say. Now, high quality flash is superb done properly, lit beautifully is amazing, but you don't have time. So you've got this conundrum between available light, which you can't control, flash on camera, which is easy and repeatable, but not that, not that effective, not for a book anyway, and then total control where you actually light the subject like a movie set. Well, obviously documentary work doesn't lend itself to that third approach. So it really comes down to working with the light that you've got on the day and not trying to fight it trying to avoid shooting in the middle of the day as much as possible but it's not always not always possible and there's where backlight comes in if you've got a harsh sunny day as long as the sun's not like 90 degrees above your head try and position yourself where the sun is slightly behind people and then you'll find that the light on their faces is reflected off other things and it's a lot softer but no uh, to answer that question briefly is no i don't use flash very very rarely indeed okay next question um do you have to ask permission to take the photograph, if you, especially if you will include the photo in your book? Yes and no. That's a long discussion. Um, this is editorial photography taken in a public place by people who have no expectation of privacy and who are also taking pictures of each other freedom, freely. So the shooting of the picture is absolutely 100% okay. No, the use of the picture is a different matter. Now, this is what I would call an editorial use. 
which means that there is no uh, advertising, there is no uh, agenda, I'm not putting forward a point of view. It is simply a case of, in, in this particular image, this is a picture of Uptown Brown at the Woodford Music Festival. That's it. There is no um, downside to that. So you could absolutely do this under Australian law. If I use this picture for advertising, uh, and, and implying that Uptown Brown promotes some product or endorses a product, that's a different kettle of fish and I can't do that without his permission, okay? Courtesy will always dictate that I will at least acknowledge the people I'm photographing and after I've taken the pictures, I usually drift around and have a word and, and they're usually fascinated to know what you're doing. So I photographed this guy doing his thing and then when he finished his little set, I just wandered over and said, oh, I was just taking a few pictures of you before. Um, he said, yeah, I noticed. And I said, oh, I'll just, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing this book on these things and it was, you know, and I showed him the pictures and he goes, oh, mate, that's fantastic. Would you mind sending me a couple? no problem at all, put his email into my phone, and now we've got that contact. And so it's actually a quite a collaborative process, but I don't ask permission first because that changes the, uh, the dynamics. The only time I'll do that is with portraits. If I just go back one slide, or oh, hang on, why is that not moving? Okay, so here's a good example. This is a picture where I clearly did ask permission. Um, because this is uh, Harry, I think, at the Gimpy Muster, and he is a camp, um, what they call them, uh, he, he goes every year, he's been going for 30 odd years, he knows how all the camps work, he sets up in the same place, and a, a, a host, a camp host, and if you have any problems when you go to camp, he'll be a guy who can show you where the toilets are, tell you how you get water, tell you what the, uh, the rules are, and so on. But he's got this spectacular camp set up with all of this memorabilia. So of course we go and talk to him, have a word. And then I say, Hey mate, do you mind if we just do a few pictures? Cause he now knows what we're doing and why we're there. And always like, I was going to say 99% of the time, but it's really a hundred percent of the time they go fine. Where do you want me to stand? You know, where, where, how do you want me to look and so on? So then you, then you take your time and you, you take your photographs. Okay. Next question. Um, Oh, Anselm Waterfield, I think I've answered that question. Uh, do you engage first or just dive in close? I don't get into people's faces. I, I don't really like the idea of wading in close and, and shooting very quickly. I'll tend to sort of circle in and I like, I like it when people know I'm photographing, but are happy to continue what they were doing. So I don't stop and say, can I take a picture? but I, I like to be in view. I'm not trying to hide. I'm just there. I'm owning the fact that I'm photographing. Um, it also gives the person a chance to, with, um, to save face and make it clear that they're not happy. Like if they leave or turn away, I, I, I'll often take that as a hint that they'd rather not be photographed. So they don't have, we don't have to confront that. I can just be there taking pictures. And if they're not happy, which is very rare, they will just, you know, disappear. Um, we don't, they don't need to say, Hey, you know, what are you doing? That never happens with this sort of work. Uh, another question, uh, Keith, hi Nick, what ISO settings do you prefer or do you use auto? Hmm. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Um, I tend to pick my own ISO, but there is a lot to be said for auto ISO used correctly. And when I say correctly, I mean setting a maximum ISO that you don't want the camera to go beyond, let's say uh, 3200, 6400 in the case of the SL2 and the Q2. And also, and this is the key thing, a minimum shutter speed. So you can set a base shutter speed, so the shutter speed will drop as the light drops down to a certain base and then the ISO goes up, which is what you would do anyway if you're doing it, uh, setting the ISO manually. So. Um, in very, very uh, fast changing lighting situations, uh, auto ISO can be really, really good. But after all the years I've been doing this, I generally pick my own ISO and leave it there, but never feel, never feel afraid of taking the ISO up to whatever it needs to be to get a sharp picture. Uh, a noisy picture can be managed. Uh, a unsharp picture due to camera shake or subject shake or movement cannot be saved. So I'd much rather see a noisy sharp picture than a blurry picture with no noise. Yeah, moving on, <laughs> this actually uh, makes an amazing print on the wall, not because of anything uh, clever I've done. I mean, a lot of people have enjoyed this picture, but it's a A2 print on the wall of the gallery, but it was actually shot on the uh, the Deluxe, um, not on the SL2 or, or the SL or the C-Lux, the CL, sorry. 
um, it's A2 print and it's, you would not pick it as being any less quality than the other images. Now I did take it carefully and it's taken at relatively low ISO. So I've given the camera every chance to be, you know, to show its, its, uh, its quality. But when you see the print, you'll go, no way that's on a little point and shoot camera. Um, I'm not exactly sure why I ended up taking it on that camera. I may have even taken it just to see what the results were like. And that's in my book uh, as a big, a big double page. And uh, it, look, it looks fantastic. Uh, question. Uh, I've answered this one already, but I'll answer it quickly again. Bertrand, um, overall, what's your favorite camera and most versatile easy to use? That would be the SL2 currently. And also, I would say the CL. Um, the SL2 is by far the better camera, but it's also considerably more expensive and bigger. So if you want to go lightweight, there's, there's nothing that touches a CL for a convenience. Uh, but if, you're, if you have a, a, a serious job to do with difficult conditions and you really want the ultimate in uh, versatility, then the, the SL is clearly the one for that. Um, Timothy Moon, ever tempted to use tilt shift? I notice everything is vertical in the shot of Harry. Yes. Um, I don't use tilt shift in, in, as a lens, but I do correct verticals in post. This shot of the trucks here is corrected in post for the perspective because it's very, very hard to judge being perfectly square onto something that is obviously geometrically rigid like this. They're all squares. So I'll do my best and then I will use the transform function in Lightroom to make sure that those horizontals are horizontal and those verticals are verticals. So I tend to not need to do it enough to justify the use of a tilt shift lens. Um, another question here, which photographers have you been your major influences in informing your own work? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, I did mention this a little bit last week, a week before last. Um, Art Wolf is a, is a good one. Salbastio Salgado, uh, anything by him is just awesome. Uh, he's probably my, my favorite photographer of all time, just in the, the level of commitment to the work. If you buy a copy of his book, Genesis, uh, you will be amazed at the, uh, the, the images in that. Uh, so Art Wolf, um, Edward Bertinsky, um, let me see, Ken Duncan, to a certain extent, uh, definitely Christian Fletcher, uh, Peter Eastway, to a certain extent, they're my friends rather than my influences, but they've all had an influence on my work. Uh, it may be I've learned how I don't want to do things uh, or how I've taken something and made it my own, um, but they've all had an influence on some level in the development of my work. Um, going back in, t uh, Tim Page, uh, he's um, ex-Vietnam War photographer. He's been a big influence on some things in the way I do things these days. Um, Ansel Adams, of course, landscape work. Uh, let me see. Um, Jan Artis Bertrand with his aerial work. Um, pretty much anybody in National Geographic, I suppose, at way back. So yeah, there, there, there's some good names. If you look up those names, you wouldn't go too far wrong in finding out, getting some inspiration. Um, next question, where are we up to? Okay, um, depth of field. Um, this is um, something that is very familiar to Leica photographers because I did mention before where I do like shooting wide open. I was lucky enough to shoot with a prototype of the current S, uh, 75mm uh, Noctilux M, which is the F1.25 75mm that uh, came out a year or so ago. It allows you to separate quite close subjects. And again, shooting into the light again, it just works. So the, the guy on the right is clearly sharp. The depth of field in this shot is no more than the length of his boots. And the horse is quite blurry in the distance. And in a print, this has a three-dimensional quality, which I really, really enjoy. This was shot on the SL as well. It's a very difficult lens to use on the M. Um, judging the focus is quite tricky on a rangefinder camera. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, and to be honest, uh, I don't get as high a success rate as I would like with the uh, M, with the wide aperture lenses. But with the SL, uh, I get probably 95% correct because you can see the magnified view in the electronic viewfinder and therefore nail the shot pretty much every time. Uh, I, with the M, I've started using the Visiflex on the top, the electronic viewfinder attachment, and that does increase my percentages, but it also makes the camera a tiny bit slower to use. So um, the Noctis on the SL and now the SL2 are just astonishingly useful. All right, um, next one, where we go? Okay, well, last couple of pictures coming up. This is um, 
a, a real privilege. Uh, uh, the, the show is a real privilege I had during the shooting of this picture because a lot of these images um, were taken, obviously, in country festivals, and a lot of the people who go to those festivals um, live in fairly remote areas. And one of the common themes was fundraising for the RFDS, uh, which, of course, is, you know, they're just a bunch of heroes as far as I'm concerned. It's an astonishing organization. Uh, it's a real glue that holds a lot of uh, very far-flung communities together. So I approached uh, the RFDS, and over a considerable length of time, it, it did take quite a long time to actually arrange this, I was eventually invited to go out on a field day, um, a clinic day, I think they call them, um, with the RFDS out of Cairns. So I flew up to Cairns and uh, joined in with these guys visiting uh, a station um, out uh, northwest of Mount, uh, Mount would it be inland from Townsville, northwest of Townsville, southwest of Cairns, about two hours flying time. And uh, it was an absolute privilege to see the doctor and the senior nurse and the pilot, how they operate. And I was just in awe of their professionalism and their, just their dedication. So there's a little section in the back of the book which uh, goes into a bit of detail about these operations. And uh, that was just superb. So look, that's that's the uh, the the end of my uh, brief presentation. I'm just going to see if my little overhead camera is going to work because I had a couple of problems with it before. Here we go. Let me just see because I wanted to just show you the picture, some pictures out of the book itself. So if I I'm just going to come back to me for a second. Hi, that's me again. I'm just going to got a little camera up here which allows me to zoom in on some pages. And if I just cut that, there we go, that's my desk. So here we go, this is what I meant to do earlier, but a um, little technical hitch in that I let the battery go flat, which is not very cool at all. So this is part of Australia. This is the, uh, let's zoom back out a little bit. There we go. I hope you can see that okay. I'll just, I'm not gonna spend too much time because we've shown you quite a few of the pictures, but. There's, this gives you an idea of the, the breadth and the depth of the pictures that we've got in this book. And I should also mention that if you wish to buy a copy of this book, you can get them from the Leica stores. And I think that all the ones they've got in stock, I've signed. So if you want a signed copy, feel free to drop by the store, or you can order them online as well through the uh, online store. Um, yeah, there's there's that, um, that rodeo picture we were talking about. So the, this is where the horse is completely sharp, but the ride is not quiet. It, it really doesn't spoil the picture at all. All right. So any more questions from anybody? I'm more than happy to answer any more questions. Um, what have we got? Uh, for starting up on the SL, what is the most versatile combination? Taking into consideration that budget is limited. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I would suggest the SL2 with the 24 to 90. This would allow you to do or 80% of what you would need to do. And then you could either break out to the 16 to 35 and the big 90 to 280, or you can fit M lenses on here too. Um, I mentioned using the LMAR, Super LMAR 18 millimeter. Uh, I use this on the SL, and that does rather change the size, can you see? So they're manual focus, but you still get this beautiful look to them. So the basic SL with the 24 to 90, you would not go far wrong with that at all. Do you use your good M lenses on the SL2 often? Yes. So um, where's, where's the SL? I've got another one here. So this is the SL2. You can tell this is actually an SL here. Um, I put that out there because this is the camera I actually shot all the pictures in the book with. This, this I got after I finished the sh after finished shooting. So you can absolutely fit the M lenses onto here. And with the electronic viewfinder, uh, when you click the, see if I can do this on this camera up here. When you click the joystick on the back, see if that will focus here. There's a joystick. Can you see that? If I get like there, we, there. As you click that, when you're using the M lenses, it magnifies the shot so you can critically focus. And it's just superb. It's a really high resolution viewfinder and you see that image magnified and it's just so easy to focus it. it it's, just, it's astonishing, particularly with the, the wide angle lens like this. Can you take the, the two horses with the CL? Yes, I took the two horses with the CL with the uh, 55 to 135 zoom, which is this one. But this is a fabulous little lens actually, you know. Um, 
It's only tiny. It's only $2,500. It's really not an expensive lens. And I've used this so much. Um, it's not a wide aperture lens. It's not an f2.8 lens. It's a 3.5 to 5.6, if memory serves. 3.5 to 5.5. 4. Point, hold on, let me read that properly. 3.5 to 4.5. That's it. I've got the wrong glasses on. So it does uh, vary its aperture slightly, but look at the size. And it's, and it's unbelievably sharp. Um, and and I, I don't say that lightly. You know, I mean, all these lenses are sharp, but this one just, 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 just amazing sometimes. Um, where to shoot rodeo events in Australia? Um, if you look at the uh, Australian uh, rodeo websites, because there's an association of uh, riders, um, there's a, two, a couple of different organizations and they organize all the rodeos, you'll see a big list of all of the events, where they are. Pretty much everywhere in the country, there will be a rodeo on, uh, on uh, at least once a year. Uh, any of the medium and small country events. And I'd actually go to the smaller events if you can, because they're a lot more flexible with the access. Um, the really big events, like the really professional events, they're very strict on who gets access. And sometimes they will just say, no, you just have to stay in the crowd and photograph you know, as per, for everybody else. But if you want to get a little bit more flexibility, go to some of the smaller country affairs and have a word with the organizers and you know, give them make contact before you go and you may find that they at least let you hang around where the riders uh, congregate because you're usually not allowed in there but the riders are a pretty friendly bunch of guys just don't get in their way or don't get between them and their bull um and some Anselm waterfield would like to know do you ever use m series uh, in yes i do uh, i use my 18 mil a lot occasionally i use i haven't got it here here we are i do have a 50 millimeter sumilux on an m uh, which I sometimes use on the SL. Um, but I tend to use the 75 mil Summicron or the 90 mil Summicron for the SL, the SL Summicron, uh, in preference because it's autofocus. And when I'm working, I don't always have the luxury of a manual focus lens. The reason I use the 18 mil is, well, for one thing, it's really tiny, which makes it very easy to carry around. Second thing is being manual focus isn't that much of a disadvantage with a super wide lens. I I generally just stick it on three meters and leave it at that and everything's sharp. So that, that's really quite easy. Um, it's also a very well-priced lens and compared to the 16 to 35 for the SL, which is really, well, it's about that big, maybe a little bit smaller. It gives you an idea of just how sweet this little lens is. Um, it's probably not quite as technically sharp as the current range of lenses. Uh, it's an older design, but I mean, we are splitting hairs here. You know, uh, that's me looking very, very closely. Um, so yeah, I use the M lenses quite a bit. All right, we'll take a couple more questions and then I think we'll uh, call it quits for today. So what, what are we, uh, up to an hour? That's great. How do you find the tracking autofocus and AF performance on the SL2? I'm considering the system for wedding work. The tracking is good. It's not the best possible, it's good. But the speed of focus, bang, focus is astonishing. Okay, like I, I wouldn't photograph a bird in flight. I wouldn't expect it to do that because you're talking 47 megapixels. Uh, that's an awful lot of work to be doing. So the, the SL2 is emphasizing the image quality over high-end sports and wildlife. Okay, it's not designed to do that very narrow niche. But when you look at everything else, it's fantastic. But for speed of autofocus, nailing the autofocus every single time, it's brilliant. And this is why I use that focus, focus, focus technique. So if, if the bride was walking down the aisle towards you, it would absolutely hold that focus as you focus. It would actually track that too as well, because that's not you know, a very fast moving subject, I hope. Um, be no problem at all with that. Um, there's, um, uh, it, there's, we've just released a video, which I did yesterday, <laughs> that's why you might not have seen it, which talks about the settings on the SL2. It, it's on our YouTube channel. I did two yesterday, one on the Q2 and one on the SL2, going through the menus and how I've got the camera set up. And there's one focus setting I didn't mention, which is the zone focusing, which is, uh, I think it's nine or 12 crosshairs in the middle. And that is really good for tracking because it gives the, the camera the, the, the possibility to, to anticipate movement. Uh, I've used it for bird photography and it's worked quite well. Um, for weddings, it would be superb. Um, other than that, I use field. But yeah, check out the video, see what you think. Okay, what do you think of the CL 18 millimeter? Perfectly good lens, um, very small. Uh, I don't have one because I've got the 18 to 56 
which obviously overlaps. So I don't need any more lenses than I've got. That's otherwise I would probably go and buy them. Um, so, but yeah, absolutely fine lens um, and very, very tiny, very, very small. So you, if you put the 18 mil on the CL, it's basically about that sticks out about that far and you can pretty much get the camera in your pocket if you want to. So as a walk around lens, it would be great. All right, last question. I'm gonna call it quits at this point. Uh, Selwyn Favish, I knew you were gonna ask me this because you've already emailed me the question, is what memory cards should one use in the SL2? I'm using the uh, SanDisk Extreme Pro 95 megabytes per second cards, mostly in the 32 gig size. That will work for the raw shooting, it'll work for high speed, everything, but not for the high end video. Okay, if you want to shoot log mode in 4K on the SL2 in 10 bit, and it is beautiful, beautifully smooth footage, you will need to go to a 300 megabit per, megabyte per second card, which is uh, considerably more expensive. But if you're not doing video at that level, then I would say that those uh, 9,500 megabyte per second cards will be absolutely fine. Um, Connor, who I know is in the chat at the moment, may have a comment on that, but that's been my experience in that one. Um, I'll go on one more, Suzanne. Okay, hi. Um, for street photography, would you prefer spot or center weighted? Uh, neither, uh, I use multi-field, okay? Spot is too twitchy and you could, that the, ex, the exposure will be all over the place with things moving around. So that's a, a studio setting really, or when you've got time. Uh, center weighted will work fine, but multi-field is like a mixture of the two, uh, and it, it, it's a lot more forgiving for the exposures when it comes to bright objects suddenly coming into view. It's a lot less twitchy. So I would use multi-field, in fact, I use multi-field all of the time for all of my cameras without exception. Okay. All right. So look, thank you so much for taking part again. Uh, we had, I don't know how many at the peak, but we've still got 139 people listening, which is really good. Um, I hope that was uh, interesting for you. Like I said, the book is available in the bookstore. I'm going to put a link up um, at the end and leave it on the screen for a few minutes. Um, you can access that through the, the physical copy through the, the stores, or you can order the physical copy online as well. As always, if you have any suggestions for future webinars or topics, uh, please let us know. Um, next week, I think I did, did say at the beginning, we've got uh, our panel. So again, we'll have the questions. I won't have uh, a presentation to do. Uh, it will be more a case of, okay, everybody, what would you like to know? I'll have some cameras here, and Bill will have his camera. He's a, he uses a CL. And um, then we've got Mark in Melbourne who uses the SL uh, and the M. So between us, we've got a range of experience and range of cameras and we can answer your questions as well. So uh, I'm going to call it quits at this minute and I will talk to you all next week. Bye for now. <laughs>